Hello, and welcome to Convince Catholicism, a place for all things Catholic. Today, I have not really a prayer book, but more of an academic slash biographical piece. This is The Life of the Virgin by St. Maximus the Confessor, and it is translated uh, by Stephen J. Schumacher. Uh, and as you can imagine, it being published by Yale University Press, New Haven, and London. This is not written from a strictly Catholic perspective, but an academic one in which uh, uh, Schumacher creates basically um, an academic translation of this. So you'll see that there are some footnotes in the book, but it's mostly pertaining to uh, the translation strategy that he used. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, St. Maximus the Confessor is one of the latest of the church fathers. He is the person who made, I guess you could say, the concept of Christ having two wills, um, I wouldn't say popular because that's the Christian truth. That is the gospel truth. Um, but he is the one that was the biggest, I guess you could say, advocate to make that the dogmatic belief. And so it is. Two wills or two natures, i.e. there is fully man and fully God. And there is a will that Jesus the man had and a will that Jesus part of the Holy Trinity had. Um, not that this is really important because you wouldn't really be praying with this per se, but uh, the book is four and three quarters, or excuse me, five and three quarters inches wide. It is uh, eight and three quarter inches tall. And that might be just about an inch or so. Let's see. Uh, yeah, just less than an inch. I would imagine that this is a armchair or poolside read. Um, very easy to read. Uh, so Maximus the Confessor, uh, obviously a very wise saint. He is a monk. He is a, a theologian. And he kind of comes up with this life of the virgin as the title suggests now this is kind of being uh this leans into i guess you could say sort of a um non-canonical gospel you'll see that there are kind of references here and there from a a non-canonical gospel so you cannot take this as scripture uh, this was written in the uh, 600s or the 7th century. So it's, like I said, it, it's it's not um, to be trusted per se. But what it does do is show what early Christians and even now, uh, what we believe about the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, or the Theotokos. So... Uh, we can see here that the introduction talks about that concept of uh, <clears throat> why this book is important, right? Because, first of all, this only existed in Greek and then Georgian, which if you haven't seen the Georgian language or don't speak it, these footnotes show what it actually looks like, which is indecipherable to me. I can do okay with Cyrillic. I can sort of do uh, okay with the Greek language, but this means nothing to me. So I find it rather impressive that um, a Western European or American person was able to uh, do this. That's very intelligent. So anyway, it originally uh, existed in Greek, as you could imagine, with the alleged uh, connection to St. Maximus. And then the, uh, then the Georgian, and now, thanks be to God, an English translation. Uh, <clears throat> just another thing of note, 
during this time, give or take a century, there was a strong debate in which many people may have lost their uh, lives or their uh, body parts for on whether or not we should call the Virgin Mary Theotokos or Christotokos. What's the difference? Theotokos means mother of God. Christotokos means mother of Christ or the Messiah. Now, here's the thing. The Virgin Mary obviously did not give birth to God in the sense that uh, God was created in her womb. Jesus Christ had always existed as the second person of the Holy Trinity, as God the Son. So that material was not created in her womb or by any seed. Uh, but it is important to understand. So technically speaking, Christotokos is a more accurate term, but the um, term Theotokos is more uh, important to uh, apply to the Virgin Mary to uh, point out that um, the essence of God was in her womb, right? So it's not that the uh, essence of God entered into Jesus's body after he was born. It was during the entire pregnancy. And that's important because it shows that the Virgin Mary does have an immaculate um, conception because the to, to serve as a tabernacle means to be pure, right? And so this is just the, uh, the introduction here. Um, it explains, in fact, the introduction is rather lengthy, to be honest with you. Uh, it comprises of the first 35 pages of the book and the rest of the book, so from page 36 to, you'll see it's not very uh, long at all, um, to 159, so 36 to 159 is the actual biography of the Virgin Mary. And these chapters are incredibly short, right? And so this really does show that the belief of the Virgin Mary being who she is in the eyes of the Catholic and Orthodox faith has existed for quite some time. Here we have chapter one, birth and childhood, right? And you can go to the table of contents and see what the different chapters are. Birth and childhood, Annunciation, Nativity, Presentation in the Temple, Revelation or Epiphany, On the Passion, On the Resurrection, The Dormition, and then we have the conclusion and then we have index and appendix and footnotes and whatever else all right so chapter one the praise and glory laud and honor of our all holy incorruptible and most blessed queen the theotokos and ever virgin mary and the story of her immaculate and blessed life from birth until the dormition written by our blessed father maximus the philosopher and confessor kiri eleison or lord have mercy and so you can see here the different chapters have some prayers in them and references to scripture. Uh, they're always going to be brief. Some of them don't even take up a whole page. Uh, we can see here, you know, the gracious and abundantly generous king looked upon the prayer of the righteous and he sent forth the good news to both of them. And we see a footnote there or a, rather a reference. First, he informed Joachim while he was standing in prayer in the temple. He heard a voice from on high that said, you will receive a child who will be who will be a glory, not only for you, but for the whole world, and etc., etc. So we see here some sort of uh, non-canon book here, right? Protev, um, which uh, obviously is not in the Bible. And because the names of Joachim and Anna are not mentioned in the Bible, but we, through... I guess folklore slash historical understanding have developed that those are their uh, the Virgin Mary's parents' names, the grandparents of Jesus Christ. Uh, we have different accounts here, right? 
on account of which the blessed David and her and the other prophets proclaimed her from the beginning as the mountain, God, the fertile mountain, mountain on which it is pleased God to dwell, etc., etc. We can see different chapters here. And honestly, like I've already mentioned, these aren't very long chapters at all, right? Uh, a lot of this is going to be inspired by gospel. The rest of it might be inspired by non-canon uh, works that were later writings. So we can see here that, uh, and it's got, it's got 134 sections, okay? So not very intense at all, but we can see here um, that there's a uh, this kind of this canon or Akathist-esque prayer, this ode or this canon here. Um, so this is definitely an interesting book to kind of reflect on. Um, we have this concept here of this, uh, of the Dormition, right? This idea that, uh, she was bodily assumed into heaven. Uh, that is dogma in the church. Uh, you have to believe that she bodily ascended into heaven. Whether she died or not is kind of up to you. The earliest of opinions is that she died a bodily death and was assumed into heaven um, to be with our Lord. Uh, but anyway, uh, we can see here that there are um, some interesting, I guess you could say, examples of what Catholics believe, right? So again, this is not written from a even a Christian perspective. This is a academic secular work, but it's uh, interesting nonetheless to see what is going on here. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Take care. God bless.